it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing a mentor of mine for a long time, Bonnie Hickson of The Progressive Dentist. And the, her website is theprodentist.com. Bonnie <laughs> Hickson is the founder and publisher of The Progressive Dentist Magazine and Network. She is dedicated to helping strong clinicians and dental professionals build successful businesses where the best dental care can be delivered. Bonnie works closely with many of the most knowledgeable and respected dental and business experts to bring their messages to their practices throughout the U.S. and Canada. She thrives on helping teams define their purpose, enhance their overall patient experience, improve practice profitability, and live a life they love. And she's right now in Lubbock, Texas, which is uh, brings back my memories because my uh, I, I grew up in Wichita. My dad had five Sonic drive-ins in Wichita. But he put one in uh, Abilene, Kansas, Kearney, Nebraska, Louisville, Kentucky, and Childress, Texas. And okay. so my four summers between high schools was always on the opening team where five of us would drive down to uh, um, Abilene one summer, Childress, Texas another summer. And I'll never forget Childress, Texas because my dad gave me his Lincoln Town car and I drove to Childress and I worked all summer on opening this brand new store. And I think I was, um, well, I know I was uh, 14 years old. And talk about how times are changing. I mean, you couldn't get a driver's license until you were 16. So I drove down there without a driver's license and uh, spent the whole summer. I lived in a hotel, and anything I ate at the uh, restaurant was billed to the room. I thought I was the luckiest kid in the world. I had a big old Lincoln Town car, all the food I could eat at the hotel, working at Sonic Drive-In. I think that was absolutely the best summer of my life. But uh, so to start off with, um, how did uh, how did you end up in dentistry? How did your journey take you to dentistry? You know, it's um, it's one of those things that um, happened accidentally, and what I thought was going to be temporarily, and it just it's it's such an amazing profession that once I got in, um, I couldn't leave. And how many times do you hear people say that? It's just it's uh, it's the people that that drew me to dentistry, and it's the reason that I stay. And what is, and if my homies went to theprodentist.com, which stands for the progressive dentist, what are they right. going to, and by the way, I just uh, retweeted uh, uh, a lot of, they're all driving to work, so they're not taking notes. Uh, and uh, so what I do is I go to my uh, Twitter and um, I'm at Howard Fran and I retweet my guest last tweet and your uh, progressive dentist on Twitter is at prodentist. And I just retweeted, on Memorial Day weekend, enjoy time with family and friends, and please remember those who pay the ultimate price for our freedom. Some, hashtag, some gave all. If they, um, if they, uh, beautiful post, if they go to uh, theprodentist.com, what are are they going to find on that website? What's it all about? You know, the website, Howard, is, is really a place where we can profile and spotlight the people who do the things in dentistry that um, help people make a difference. So they're going to see sample content from what we publish in our magazine. Um, They're going to see some resources from our online platform and learning community. Uh, A lot of different things there. We've got a news feed there for important things that are happening in dentistry from, you know, industry companies and um, experts. So, Everything that pertains to dentistry, but only the business side of it. So we don't do we don't do anything clinical. There are some amazing clinical resources out there. A lot of them, from Spear to you know to Dental Town to a lot of other places. And all we talk about is the business of running a productive practice and being able to have a practice that you really love to go to every day. You, you know where you can get the best online learning to do. Uh place implants and root canals, the very best. Where's that? YouTube. I have so many friends that they come home at night, they go to YouTube, they, they, how to place a dental implant, and they watch videos for like two or three hours. I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, if someone said to me, how many hours of clinical dentistry are on YouTube? I mean, I don't even know how I'd get my head around that number. The searches are infinite. That's the difference between today and when you and I started doing what we do, Howard. Media was a, a, a much tougher thing to produce 20 years ago. Um, today, it's, it's, it comes from everywhere, and um, it's, you know, it's the people who are consuming the media that are also doing the production. So there's, there's any number of resources out there that are great, 
Um, but it also kind of clouds the space to the point that you're not exactly sure what level of expertise some of these people who are posting have. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, but I love that information is easy to find. Now, is your magazine a, a subscription model? It is. So um, how much how much does that uh so how do they subscribe? So if they go to theprodentist.com, huh? I see request for a free trial. Yeah, so if they don't know what we're about, um, they've never seen a copy of the magazine, they can go request a free trial, just give us your email address to send you a link. Um, and we'll let you see what we're all about and send you a, a sample copy. Otherwise, you can subscribe. There's a big green subscribe button on the website, so you can subscribe right there. And what? And how much does it cost? Is it a monthly? How much does it cost? It's bi-monthly, so every other month. And uh, we publish digital content every month. So even when there's not a magazine coming out, there's digital content available. Um, but it's a, a bi-monthly subscription, and it's 167 bucks a year. Nice. Uh, and then what is the difference, Bonnie, between... Uh the pro dentist.com mm -hmm. and you also have uh, the pro practice.com. What's the difference between the pro dentist and the pro practice? So the, the, the pro dentist is the progressive dentist magazine is where we started. That was, that was the beginning of where our community started to evolve um, where we brought what, what I feel like are uh, vetted resources and some of the best consultants, coaches, and, and corporate connections in dentistry that really provide great service for, for progressive dentists. Um, so on the magazine is all of that type of content. It's articles, um, it's videos and, and interviews with different people around dentistry, sometimes dentists, sometimes consultants, sometimes um, we have some things coming up that will be patients too, just talking about the new dynamics in dentistry. Um, the pro practice is an online community where, um, and I guess I should say too, if you're a member of the pro practice, which is where uh, our CE courses and podcasts and that sort of thing live, if you're a member of that community, then the magazine is part of that. So it's in included in your subscription fee. So we, d we try to make it easy for people to be a part of our community, whether it's just the magazine whether it's um, you know through the, the learning community, which is the pro practice, or our live events that we do. So it's, it's all about being accessible and being affordable, but a great value for, for what you invest. And I want to I say something to the kids out there. Someone, if you're listening to this, you're cynical, you might be thinking, well, Howard, if you have a magazine, she has a magazine and all this stuff, then why, why would you be, be promoting uh, a competitor? Well, that, that, that's, that's living in fear and scarcity. I, I'm a dentist. I don't know one single dentist on earth that only reads one magazine. No. And I'll tell you, when you get out of school, you're going to find out that half the dentists in your neighborhood think in fear and scarcity and think you're the competition and don't want to have anything to do with you. And the other half are like, come on over and drink beer and barbecue. And and the people that think in hope, growth, and abundancy. And, and just Google for pictures of uh, um, uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. I mean, who – I mean, those – Two successful men, fiercely competitors, but who else would they want to hang out with? I mean, if, if you were if you were Macintosh, the other guy was was uh, uh, Microsoft. I mean, obviously, you have more in common than anybody else on earth. But um, yeah. you know, it's the same thing. These young dentists are afraid to go ask the oral surgeon if they can watch watch him or her pull wisdom teeth, and they're too afraid, so they'll fly across the country and drop three grand to watch someone else. And all they had to do is walk across the street. And if one oral surgeon did say no. Well, you don't even want to know that idiot anyway because he, he lives in fear and scarcity and it's bad karma. So exactly. if, if, if you go knock on his door and he says no, thank God you're not going to waste time referring patients to him. And go find someone that says, I mean, it, it, when some, all the oral surgeons I know, when some 25-year-old punk kid comes out of school and wants to learn how to pull a wisdom tooth, they're excited. Sure. They're excited to teach some young kid how to pull a wisdom tooth. I mean, what more fun is there than that? Well, and, and Howard, I have to say, of, you know, and I get that question a lot. So who's your competition? Who do you compete with? And, you know, the answer is we don't. We, we play our game. We do things a little differently. We talk about some of the same things you do in Dentaltown, but we talk about a lot of different things, too. And it's, it's a different, um, it's just a different model. And I am a firm believer in the fact that I wouldn't be here today um, doing what I'm doing if it hadn't been for you paving the way to allow us to have this space to, to communicate with people who have been den in dentistry for 
decades or new dentists just coming out of school going, okay, now <laughs> this is all great, but where do I start? So I appreciate you, um, you being back there, um, cheering me on since the day we started and it's, it's been <laughs> great to share space with you. Well, and, and it's funny, like people say, well, do you recommend going to Panky or Dawson or Spear or Quest? And I would say, you know, I don't really know because I went to all four. I yeah. mean, you know, and they're like, well, which camp are you? Well, I don't even believe in camps. I believe. And what I love about your information is $167 a year. That's not even one night in a hotel when they go to these $4,000 a weekend courses. I mean, I, I love it when you can get use the Internet to learn faster, easier, higher quality, lower price. And like, say, if you want to learn how to place implants just and, and you have a smartphone and YouTube, what, what's your next question? Right. Well, and, and, you know, people will say, okay, so, so dental town's free and all the other dental publications are free. So, you know, what, what's the point and, you know, why do you charge a subscription? And I would say that the biggest difference and maybe something really important for them to understand is that um, we chose this model specifically to be different. And I know that, um, you know, we, we all pay attention to what we invest in, right? Whether it's two bucks or whether it's 167 or whether it's a thousand, it doesn't matter. Um, I want them to have some so-called skin in the game. So when it comes in the mail uh, or into their inbox, they go, okay, hey, I've invested in this. This better be good. And I want them to hold us to that. Um, well, Dental Town is going to switch to a subscription where they have to pay to log on. As soon Good. as I get married and divorced again. Yeah, um, I can't you know, say I support when, that much, Howard, but you're going to do your thing. So When, when i got to come up with another <laughs> $3.8 million, I'll have to go to the subscription model. But until then, I'm going to stay <laughs> single and keep the website free. Hey, what do you – okay, so this is Memorial Day, and thanks for coming on to the the, uh, the Dentistry Uncensored Memorial Day barbecue, and it's just me and you. Um, we have uh, – this coming Friday, about 6,000 kids are going to graduate from 56 dental schools, and they think they finished. They're, they're, they're too young and dumb to know they, that, that just, they just started. I mean, the light turned green. They're going to walk out of dental kindergarten and start their journey across the street. But a lot of them have bad attitude, Bonnie, as saying that, oh, Howard, you're, you're 54. You, you graduated in the golden years, and I'm coming out in the corporate dentistry years, and, and they don't even know if they made a right decision. What would If you were given a commencement speech to all 56 dental schools, what would you, and they probably could all fit in that Dallas football arena of yours up the street from you. <laughs> uh, if, they, if they were in that arena, all 56 schools, what would your commencement speech, what would it go like? You know, I, I think the most important thing, if I could give – one big piece of advice to dental school new grads um, or students, start now in building your own network. Um, you know, yeah, so you're 50 some years old, I'm 40 some years old, and, and we've been around this industry for a long time. And yes, things were different when we started, but things are changing so much faster today than they've ever changed, and they'll continue to do that. So there's no one way to do this. There's no one right answer in terms of what type of practice is going to be successful or profitable or anything else. Um, so all I can say is start building your network early. Get to know people who know what you don't know and um, develop that network early on so that when you do have questions and you get into practice and realize, oh, wow, I don't know it all yet. Um, you don't have to figure this out on your own like so many people did by being afraid to ask or, or having other people in their communities who, who wouldn't answer their questions. Ask the questions. There's a million people out there that will help you, um, but you have to be comfortable in, in knowing that you don't know it all and you're never going to know it all. So one thing that I'd, um, you know, I had a post, you talked about Twitter earlier. One of the things that I love is a quote from uh, Jim Rohn, which is, you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And if you think about that, um, you, know, you can spend your time with any kind of people you choose, but they're either going to bring you up to a higher level of performance and higher code or whatever you want to call it, or they're going to drag you down. So it's completely up to you, but building that network and expanding on it is, is the most important thing that you can do starting out. Well, if you're the average of the five people you hang around with the most, I am doomed because because I spend all my time with my four boys. My God, I, my God, <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have a chance. I don't you're have a chance. Great. 
Um, <laughs> actually, Ryan, that means you should leave. <laughs> save you, save yourself, Ryan. Run, run, run. Um, you know, I I love uh, on your website how you talk about how um um you know the cor the the corporate dentistry models are evolving, and that that is so profound because. You know, the first round of corporates, Orthodontic Centers of America made it to the New York Stock Exchange. A dozen were on NASDAQ. They all collapsed, crushed. They're all gone. <laughs> then 10 years go by. Now they're all back. And now they're back. And not one of them could go public. I mean, dentists think that corporate's taken over the world. Wall Street has zero interest in it. But I want, but I want to talk about a more profound question. Because the one problem with corporate and private practice is the old guys don't want to hire these kids that come out of school because they all leave your office after a year or two. So, you know, you introduce them to all your patients. Uh, here, I want you to introduce to Bonnie Hickson. She's all that. And, uh, you know, you'll love her. And then a year or two later, they come back. Where's Bonnie? Oh, she, she left. And so um, the corporates, some of the chains, average associate only stays a year. The better ones, the average associate only stays two years. And when you start talking to 50, 60 year old dentists that could hire, I mean, there's 150,000 dentists. They could hire that whole 6,000 graduation class in an hour just to work in their office the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday that they're closed, increase their convenience, you know, open seven days a week. I'll do my Monday through Thursday. And if you just came in here with one assistant who could answer the phone and assist you, and you just did one toothache a day, a root canal build up and crown for $2,000. We're all making money. We're all, but dentists don't even want to deal with that because they say every time I've had an associate, they hang out for a year or two, then they want to start their own. So what would you say to the old guys who don't want to hire them? And what would you say to the young kids who are trying to find a job? Well, so so to the older guys, I would say you, And that's not me. I mean I'm one of the younger ones. I'm talking yeah, about the, the just, older, older guys. <laughs> the older guys, maybe the guys who just don't get the new dynamics of the, the <laughs> dead coming into the market, I guess. Um, I would say that, that you do have to communicate differently with younger dentists. Um, it's a, it's a different generation. They value things a little differently or value different things than you and I did growing up. Um, I think it's safe to say that when you came out of dental school, Howard, there was no question that you would own a practice, right? Yeah, I got it. I got it up and running four months out. Yeah, graduated so, May 11, opened up September 21st, and just had my 30 year anniversary at my practice a week ago. Love that. Congratulations! On May 11. Congratulations! But yeah, so so that was your dream, and you made it happen. You ran out and grabbed the bull by the horns and, and made it happen. Um, every dentist coming out of dental school now doesn't have an aspiration to be an entrepreneur or to own a practice. Um, the finances of owning a practice are different. The the load um, of responsibility is perceived differently. And so every dentist doesn't want to own a practice. Some are happy to be associates. Some are thinking that they're going to go into the, um, you know, so-called corporate dental method uh, or, or practice model. But I'll, I'll say two things to the to the older doctors who are trying to attract younger dentists to come into the practice as um, associates or potential partners at some point, learn to speak their language, um, learn what's important to them and be really, really sure about what your culture and values are. What's your, um, what's your model and be clear on that with them so that you know that you're on the same page from the beginning and that you want the same things. Otherwise, yeah, they're going to come in for a year and they're going to leave. Um, to the younger dentist, I would say one, maybe one piece of caution I would offer is that a lot of the big um, corporate dentistry or you know bigger organized dental companies are in dental schools all the time talking about how great it is to you know come in. We'll give you the signing bonus. We'll give you a guaranteed salary. You don't have to worry about it. You just come in and, and practice dentistry. And to the entrepreneurially minded dentist, it sounds great because you've got a guaranteed um, guaranteed salary. You can start to work on those student loans that you've got to pay off and um, learn the business behind running a practice before you go and do your own. It's not how it works. Um, if you go to work for one of these larger companies, the only way you're of value to them is when your butt's in the chair and you're producing. So they don't want you looking behind the curtain and trying to figure out how to run your practice. They want you producing. Um, so if you're doing that simply to learn the ropes, 
probably not a good move. Uh, you're better off to associate with someone that you know has a, a common sense of values and direction for the practice and learn from somebody, um, as you said, that really wants to mentor and teach you and, and help you get faster, get better at your clinical dentistry and learn how to run a business. So um, you got to be really clear about what you want and who you approach to help you get there. You know, a lot of their questions, though, you know how sometimes you're, you're, you're naughty, um, old enough to know what you don't know. You know, you're, you're too young to not even know what you don't know. It seems like so many of their questions on Dental Town are like, okay, I'm going back to Lubbock, Texas, and there's two jobs. One will pay me 30%, but I have to pay half my lab bill, and the other one will pay me 25%, but I don't have a lab bill. Which one would you go to? And it's like, really? It just, it just comes down to that? Don't you, don't, do you want to be a mentor? I mean, what, what, if, what if one yeah. dentist, had, his average staff had been there 10 years, and the other dentist's average staff been there a year and a half, uh, you know, what if, you know, I mean, what if, should they be looking for? If, if I, if, if she comes out of school, I know what she's thinking. She's saying, Bonnie, I'm $350,000 of student loans. I got to make coin. I just want the most coin. I don't care about all that other stuff. What would you say to her? I would say that's the whole, that's the wrong way to go about it. Um, Howard, nothing, nothing makes me more sad than to see dentists who say, I hate, I hate this. I hate being a dentist. I hate the practice. I hate being in the chair. Um, it breaks my heart to know that they put that much time and money into an education only to get into a situation where they hate to get up and go to work in the morning. Um, that mentality, that type of approach to your dental career is exactly what creates that circumstance. So I guess it goes, you know, it comes down to do the right things and the money will come. And it's, it's hard when you're $350,000 in debt to believe that I think it's it's um it's daunting of course it is it's uh you know looming over your head that you've got this super heavy debt load to carry but if you go into it just looking at how can I make money you're gonna get into that churn and burn mentality um into a, a you know a, an environment where it's all about the money and you know get them in get them out rather than having an opportunity to go into or build a practice where it's all about the patient, where you can focus on what they really need, what they really want, and then giving them what they need instead of what you want them to have. So yeah, the, the, the allure of a, of a steady paycheck is, is tempting, of course it is, but you really have to look at why you went into dental school in the first place, and what do you want out of this? What do you want to create? Who do you want to be around? And what type of dentistry do you want to provide? So it, it can't be all about the money and, and figuring out how to pay your student loan debt off or you're, you're destined for that early burnout and being one of those unfortunate dentists who just go, man, I, I chose the wrong profession. I hate this. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. And for the most part, it's not. And, um, that's it, you know, with, with well, the you know, it was profound what you said that you, you said earlier that you're a summary, you're, your whole personality is a summary of the five people you hang out with. So if you're in this churn, you know, mill, uh, churn them and burn them uh, deal and everybody has not happy, they don't have purpose, they don't love it and everything, then that's going to take you down. Whereas if you found an associate of an office where they just truly loved dentistry and they were happy and they were running red lights on the way to get to work, then you'd be totally happy. So if you're not happy, and that's what I liked the most about uh, when I got my FAGD and my MAGD, because when yeah. you went to those courses, everybody there was going for it. Whereas your drinking buddies from dental school, half of them wanted to burn the school down, you know, they're so, you know, they were all your buddies drinking and saying, ah, oh, dentistry sucks, but you go find the group, you go hang, you go find five homies in your backyard that want to get their diplomat, FAGD, any alphabet soup and anything, they're going, their enthusiasm is going to fuel you. Well, and I, I think, Howard, you're a prime example of the fact that um, there's no such thing as burnout. You still love to do dentistry. You still love being in the practice, but you do some different things to make sure that not only do you stay engaged and on top of what's happening out there, but you're meeting people all the time. You're you're mentoring young dentists and I mean and colleagues that you know maybe your dental school buddies, but you inspire each other to do more, to do better, and to find a better way. And obviously, you're you're still loving dentistry, and so you're you're a great example of that. I'm um, 
I'm 54, and my best friend from Dentistry at 54, at 54, just did his first all-on-four dental implant case. Tommy did. Tom Madden. I mean, I couldn't believe It's like, God dang. And, and the most inspiration I ever had where I almost fainted, I was lecturing in L.A., and a 92-year-old dentist came up to me. He survived Auschwitz. He's, he doesn't know anybody who still, uh, he doesn't know one person that was still alive from Auschwitz. 92 years old, just upgraded his two-dimensional pano to a three-dimensional CBCT and told me he'd already sunk 11 implants. And he said he's never yeah. had this much fun in dentistry. And he was 92 years old. I love that. And that's, you know, that's, that's maybe something else that's different, Howard, about dentists who are just coming into the profession versus um, those who have been here for, you know, 20, 30 and 40 years is that people used to think that, you know, when I'm 65, I'm going to retire, I'll be done. Um, I know a lot of dentists that are in their fifties and sixties that possibly it was financial circumstances with the whole mess of our, you know, our economy and everything that's happened over the last decade or two. Um, you know, all these different things that have happened have changed their circumstances and the outcome that they thought maybe um, their careers would look like. They're still practicing well into their 60s, uh, 70s, your, your buddy into his 90s. And as long as your hands are steady and your mind sharp and you've got the skills, if you love going to work, why would you retire? Um, and it's really it's really easy to create a, a plan and a strategy and a, and a model now where you can you can retire whenever you want to in the practice instead of from the practice. And the other thing, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people like to get out their miniature violin and have a pity party about, you know, poor, poor, poor me. I'll tell yeah. you what, if you're a 25 year old millennial, who would you rather be a 25 year old dentist when in your career, they're, you're their next 40 years. So they're 65. The, mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to have the biggest disruptions in the world from artificial intelligence, the internet of things and robotics. Yeah. You're going to go, Taxi drivers are going to go to driverless cars. Semi drivers are going to go to driverless cars. The artificial intelligence, I mean, Bill Gates and several PhD economists and uh, and writing in The Economist has said this could destroy 25 to 50 million jobs. And what's the chance artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, or robotics could replace a dentist doing a filling on the distal number three? You know what? That goes That goes back to your whole... Um, comment earlier on about scarcity minded people. Um, sure, it's going to automate some jobs. Any, all the new technologies and advantages that we have are going to make some jobs obsolete. It's going to make some, you know, current models of the workforce unnecessary, but it also creates other opportunity. So if you look at it from that perspective, that it's just, it's just a change. And we can fight against it. We can stick our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening, or we can figure out where it's going and get on the front edge of it and direct it and, you know, be a part of making it a positive change and something that we want to be involved in. So um, I think it's all mindset. And that's, that's maybe something that we, you know, it takes a lifetime. I'm still learning. I, 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 um, I'll always be um, ready to learn something new only because that's how it stays exciting and how you figure out how do you plug in and make a difference? You know, I'm going to practice until I finally build my dream office. And that's when I replace all my staff with droids. I want to <laughs> replace them with R2D2, C3PO. And I'm going to, I'm going to practice till that day. till I can just tell my staff, you're all fired and you've been replaced by droids. I want to come see when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what Jan will say. I always tell people that when they say, "What are you going to retire?" and I say, "I I have a pro I saw my statement system for thirty years." I said, "Jan, if you ever quit, you got to tell me five minutes before you quit, so I can quit first, and then you quit after me." I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go out whenever she leaves because I the How woman finishes all my sentences. She hands me stuff I don't even know I need. Sometimes <laughs> sometimes she'll hand me an instrument. I'll look at it. And I'll hand it back. Then she'll take it and smack my hand with it, and that means, okay, dude, you're you're, you're losing it. <laughs> think, think, think. And then I'm looking at that instrument thinking, oh, I do need that instrument. But um, and, and why she's that good? Do you know why what? she's that do you know why she's that good? Why? Because that's the kind of people that you have brought into your practice. That's that's by design. You didn't that's not by default. You've designed 
a team that works well with you, that is intuitive and knows how you create value for your patients. So it's, um, it's, it's a matter of what you make it. And then, and so, so let me, let me go back to that. Um, my, my key for when the associate is looking for a job is, you know, back to that graduating classes, um, mm-hmm. they got to learn, you know, take a job where you're going to learn the most important skill set. What do you think when, when you walk out of dental school and you're 25, what do you think she lacks the most? Is it leadership? Is it management? Is it how to do a filling, a crown, a root canal? What do you think she should be looking for in a job? You know, it's, it's the clinical dentistry is always going to be important. And you've got a great basis for that when you leave dental school. But you still have to work on your speed. You help, still have to work on the quality of um, the finished procedures. That will come in time. You, you're not going to get that overnight. I think what can really set you apart more quickly than anything else is definitely developing some leadership skills and having a really solid foundation of what kind of culture do you want to create? What do you want to be a part of? And when you hire a team, you're not hiring um, a dental assistant or an office manager or an admin or a TC. You're not hiring a role. You're hiring someone to share your vision and create this incredible experience and outcome for your patients. So it's it's all um, it's all tied to being able to be clear about what you want and define that vision and your practice culture and what you really love about dentistry to anybody who might want to be a part of your team. Learning how to hire the right people who bring the energy and enthusiasm and passion for dentistry and patient care um, is. I, I can't emphasize that enough. And it's something that we don't spend any time on in dental school. And they're so rushed to, to make money and do the procedures that sometimes that's overlooked until well into their careers. And they look back and realize they wasted an awful lot of time. So Bonnie, um, this 25 year old boy just graduated and my God, they're in love with themselves. They do think they're all that. They're just, you know, they got their hair spiked and they got their moose going and all this stuff like that. And they, they don't even know they're not a leader yet. How do you ramp a kid up into leadership? Because, because remember when you're 25, I know you think you're all that, but you got to sell dentistry to people who are 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. And I can't tell you in the last 30 years, how many second opinions I've done. And the turnoff was, and, and, and a lot of it's, uh, old stereotypes like you know how many 75 year old men still come to me because there's a guy in my neighborhood that has a full beard and they just think it means you're unemployed and you're nasty and and he doesn't want some grotesque beard hanging out and you know, so so how do you ramp a kid up to leadership and plus when he buys that office he's got to be a leadership maybe to the same age dental assistant, but he might have a 60 year old office manager. He might have a 75 year old consult. How do you ramp a, a kid up in leadership? What's the fastest way to become a leader? You surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are, whether you realize it or not. Um, being able to communicate effectively with people from different generations is, it's never been important than it is now. And, you know, at every stage of your career, and if you think back, Howard, there's, there's, there's a downside and a, a challenge behind every stage of your career. Coming into dentistry, how you know, depending on how you may be super confident, you may have no confidence whatsoever. Um, but you're going to get those comments of, okay, so, but where's the doctor? Because you look like a kid. So, so let, I'd, I'd like to talk to the real doctor. You're going to get that stuff. Um, you're also going to get people who don't feel comfortable because you couldn't possibly be old enough to do dentistry. Um, they need to learn to communicate and learn how to calmly and articulately identify with a patient and help them understand that I get what you want. I understand what you're here for, and I'm going to do the best I possibly can given whatever criteria or circumstances you've created in that discussion. So communication is the biggest, uh, that, you know, leadership culture, those things are the, the fluffy stuff. Um, in some people's opinions. And, and all I can say is that's, that's maybe more important at every stage of your career going forward than, than your clinical skills. That's got to be good. You've got to be good clinically. 
but you can't underestimate the importance of the, the soft skills or the people skills. So um, I want you to put on your mom hat. Let's say you had a 25 year old daughter uh, that just came out of dental school, which uh, you're from Texas. So it's, it's, it's possible. They, they have them. They have them young down there. I have, uh, anyway, too, that story is too close to home. But um, a lot of times their complaints are, and they're, they're really emotionally hurt. And you can tell they're emotionally traumatized because they got a job in the office. They think they're getting along with the assistant and the hygienist, the front office. But, quote, them front office women, damn it, they keep giving the patience to the old guy. And they, they try to go to lunch with them. They try to be their friend. They try to do everything. And then when push comes to shove, they, they give that, that toothache, that whatever, to the old guy. And they just feel like they're, they're getting, uh, um, you know, how do, how do you get experience if you keep giving it to the old guy? What, what would you say to her? I, I would say that life's not fair. And they're not going to start referring to you overnight. You're going to have to be willing to um, meet people where they are and do a really good job of, of making sure that they understand that you are uh, a great resource for them and someone who deserves their referrals. So the great advantages that they have today are you know, Google reviews and all these different online review opportunities. It only takes one patient to rave and say, that was the best dental experience I've ever had. And um, you know, Dr. Farin was, was so understanding of my circumstances. I felt like he heard me and understood what I needed and what I wanted. Um, when people can start to see that young dentist or not, you're interested in the best outcome for the patient and you're capable of producing them, you'll get more referrals, but they're not going to just pour in in droves unless you're in that ultimate um, pool of, of referral sources. Otherwise, go out there and uh, Go out there and get them yourself. <laughs> and as far as these Google reviews, like I'll meet, I'll meet a 25 year old uh, dentist out of school, and um, she's got no reviews. I'm like, you have nine drinking buddies, you have four sisters, you got a dozen aunts. Why can't you send an email to all your family, friends, and relatives and say, write me a damn Google review? I mean, it blows my mind. Some, so sometimes, weird. sometimes yeah. you'll have a 60 year old dentist who's doing free dentistry on 12 different cousins. And he mm -hmm. doesn't even have a review. It's like, well, at least just say no more free dentistry on the family until you all get uh, me a review. I mean, sure. uh, it's so easy to ask for and it's so easy to make it easy for the patients to do it, that there's no excuse not to have some some visible reviews out there. Um, and you know, as far as de developing those referral relationships, it takes time. Um, you can't go in and just be a nice guy or, or, or a woman who's, who's easy to, to talk to. Um, and expect them to start referring all their business. It, it takes time, and they need to know that you're serious and in it for the long haul, and not just not just looking for for referrals. Take care of their patients too, and and um, make sure that you refer them back to the place where you where you found them at times, um, depending on the situation, and it'll come. You know, I really like that video you have on thepropractice.com. I think that's a really great video, and it looks like you did it real well. If you email that to uh, Ryan at dentaltown.com um, in, like, a YouTube format, we could put that on the end of this. Uh... Yeah, I'd love to. So the, so the video I think you're looking at um, is the one that um, – and I'll just – just to simplify for people. So the progressive dentist is a couple of things. That's – uh, that's a great interview that we did. Uh, Joanne Majors is my colleague who, who developed the pro practice platform. And we do podcast and video interviews with people from dentistry, but also in business. And then when it's a business guru or expert, we translate what that means for a practice. So the, the video that you're referring to is with, um, a psychologist, uh, his name is Josh Packard. And he talks about why it's important to develop relationships and why people won't just go to a dentist because he's got credentials, you know, out to here and, and has a, a great certificate on the wall that says he's a good dentist. People want to know that you understand them before they trust you with their care. So um, that's a great interview, and I'd be glad to send it to you. So you no, can no, whatever, whatever, whatever video you want. I mean, you have yeah. other videos that explain your website. The magazine, yeah. just, just any video. Um, when you when you talk about other business leaders, uh, my only uh, stupid, uh, really dumb and insane vice is uh, the Arizona Cardinals football. I can't tell you how much time I waste every year 
watching football games. That's why I never throw anyone under a bridge who spends all their day uh, watching Jerry Springer. Because at least <laughs> on Jerry Springer, you know why they're all mad at each other. I have no idea why I went the Cardinals to crush the, the Dallas Cowboys. What do, you, what do you think of Jerry Jones as a business leader? You know, I, I think he's done some great things, whether you love him or hate him. Um, he's made a name for himself. And it's uh, his players know where he stands and they know what he expects. And that's, you know, that's that's hard to do for some people. So just because you're a great leader doesn't mean everybody's going to like everything you have to say or everything that you do. But they'll never question what your motivation is and what your ultimate outcome is. Yeah. Um, so many uh, the young kids, uh, 25, they're so obsessed to what everyone thinks about them. And that's something that is, I think it's hardwired at birth that a social animal knows it has to work together. Yeah. All the apes and monkeys obey the 400 pound gorilla. And so when you get out of line, it's supposed to make you feel bad. But um, I, I guess the next question is, do you, do you think they're, do you think, take Jerry Jones. Do you think leader, do you think those they're born leaders and that a lot of these 25 year old dentists really aren't ever going to be a leader? Or do you think, you can, uh, do you think you're born a leader or do you think you can learn it? Is this something you can train? Because I, I saw the same question about everything from playing the piano to sports or whatever. Do, do you think you're born that way or do you think you can develop it? You know, whether it's, it's a franchise owner or a coach or a dentist leading a team, um, I think to an extent we're all born with certain levels of ability or maybe, maybe people are, some, some people are more wired to be great leaders or um, influencers. But what I can tell you is that none of the biggest gurus you'll ever either read or listen to got to be as great at what they do at inspiring and improving people's leadership skills. Um, they didn't start out that way. They, they worked at it. They honed their skills. They really worked hard to create this, existence in the you know the place that they are. So are some people more suited to being strong leaders? Of course. Some people have personality types that are more suited to to leadership. But I do believe that you can be at whatever level you're a leader, I think you can always be better by surrounding yourself with people who can help you improve those skills. I also know that if you just decide that you don't want to be a leader, that it's not something that um, a role that you're comfortable in or, or that you feel like you can inspire to the level that you need to, then you need to find somebody else in the practice who can take on that role for you and work side by side with them so that the team has a clear leader and a clear direction. So you have two choices, either become a leader or find someone that you trust at a level that they become that leader and fill that role. But a team um, can't function effectively without strong leadership. Um, a lot of these graduates, back to the graduating class, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are kind of come out. One of their biggest complaints, they're going to say, Bonnie, can you believe I graduated $350,000 in debt? I didn't do one orthodontic case. I didn't do one Invisalign case. I know you've been an orthodontic, um, very, uh, big leader in the orthodontic field forever. Um, what would you say to her if she asked you, do you think I should learn Invisalign or do you think I should learn ortho? What, what would you, what would you say to her? I would say that you need to, yes, you need to learn about it. Um, depending on the type of practice that you're looking to build, I think it's important to be able to answer a patient's questions. So Invisalign is a big thing. They, they did a great thing by creating the first major um, direct consumer ad advertising campaign, and they were obviously in, insanely successful. So Invisalign is a household word now. People know what it is. So as a dental professional, whether it's the dentist or a team member, you better know what it is and how to talk about it. Whether you do it or not, it's your decision. But um, I would say if you decide to do it in your practice, either you need to become really, really good at it or have someone in the practice who is. Um. There are nine specialties recognized by the American Dental Association. You live in Texas where they just had a lawsuit that said, yeah. state of Texas, we don't recognize any of those specialties. And, and then state of Texas is right. I mean, the American Dental Association is a membership organization club. And yeah. Texas, who uh, is the Lone Star State, and if you mess with Texas, they'll succeed from the union. They already got their, their backup <laughs> flag flying with the Lone Star State. And they said, we don't recognize any of these specialties. 
Um, and and I think the local state board of dental examiners mm-hmm. are starting to get tossed around by the Supreme Court, like that bleaching case in Tennessee that said, well, you don't want them to do bleaching at the mall because you're protecting your own economic incentives. So now all the courts from the Supreme Court to the state courts are saying, hey, you guys have these clubs to protect your profit margins, and we're, we're not going to play that way anymore. But I have to tell you the truth, and I know, and you might not want to answer this because you got too many orthodontist friends, but it seems like if you ask an endodontist, can you help me learn endo? They always say, hell yeah, because they know you, you're you not going to be able to do any of your retreats, especially second most. Great. You ask an oral surgeon, can I watch you learn how to pull a teeth? He says yes, because he knows there's a million wisdom teeth you could never dig out. But it seems like orthodontists don't really like to share. It seems like it seems like um, if she goes and knocks on all the endodontists, all the oral surgeons, all the periodontists, says, can I come in on my day off on Wednesday and watch, they'll all say yes. At least 80% will say yes. What percent of the orthodontists would say yes? You know, I will I will grant you that. Or is this too close to home for you to answer? No, not at all. I, I think I think traditionally you're exactly right. Um, that specialty has been probably the least apt to um, to share their knowledge and to help help a guy out. Um, if there are scarcity minded specialists, and you know, I hope hopefully they'll take this the way it's intended. Traditionally, the ortho specialty has has been that specialty. But I do see it relaxing some. I do see people starting to realize that just because you help a general dentist out or just because you help another orthodontist out uh, doesn't mean less for you. There's plenty to go around. And and I do see people really starting to adapt that mentality more. Um, we got a long way to go. But I think it's it, it's all you know what you said before that you can either be the scarcity minded I've got to keep it all to myself or they're going to take over my practice or you can realize that there's enough to go along or enough to go around and the more you can help people become better at what they do the better results there are for the patients and everybody wins that way. You know, since they're the most scarcity minded of all the specialists, I mean by you know by by probably twenty percent of all the other eight specialists. And 80% of all the orthodontists, it's the biggest, since, since that supply and demand, it's the biggest practice builder for orthodontists. They don't get it. Every time I find a young orthodontist that scales to two to four million overnight, he set up a study club at his office once a month for all the dentists in 10 mile drive of his office to Absolutely. go over models and cases. Because what happens with most of the dentists that get interested in ortho, it's, it's all neat for a while. And they're like, man, I can make twenty five hundred in a root canal billet and crown. I don't want to make twenty five hundred dollars over the next two years, and so they dabble with it. But if but if you're teaching me how to dabble, where do you think all my ortho referrals are going? Well, exactly, and I I think it's it goes back to you know the we keep going back to this, but it it centers on building those relationships. So teach them, help them, um, and then when they need some help, where are they going to refer? It's going to be back to you. So uh, it's. It's about creating those environments where people are, are comfortable asking you questions. They know that you'll offer the help and the referrals would come back to you. So um, just, again, be selective in, your, um, in the way that you build your network and the people that you surround yourself with. If there's an orthodontist in your area that um, is completely against general dentists doing ortho or Invisalign or anything else and they're bound and determined they're not going to help you, then find another guy. Um, that attitude is something that will transfer into the way that they communicate with their patients and their teams and everyone else. And it's a, it's a toxic, um, it's, it's a toxic mentality. So there's plenty of people out there that are, that are willing and anxious to share their expertise. And those are the ones you need to find. Don't focus on the ones you can't get focus on the ones that are happy to help you out. Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, and another thing, um, in fact, I'm also, you keep talking about they need to develop relationships. They need to get a job that's a mentor and find out what do they need to mentor on? Is it leadership skills? Is it running a practice? Or maybe you want to be an implantologist. You want to work for some guy because he sinks, uh, you know, 50 implants a month. But another thing I'm uh, really dead set against is I don't think the first five years out of school, you're smart enough uh, to put your uh, crown and bridge in in a box and mail it to another state or another country, you need to go to that lab 
and, and you just send your lab, you need to go down there because the lab, may, you need a mentor and you need to see your impression in the tray box versus the other 10 dental offices working for. And when I started my own office, I did something very illegal, like if it was age discrimination, but for every position, I hired the oldest person. The only one that was my age was Jan because that was the oldest dental assistant and and she'd been doing it for seven, eight years while well, I was in school for seven, eight years. But, you know, I wasn't, I was at 24, I can train a hygienist. So I hired one that was like 55. Same thing, I got the most experienced people, but you need to find a lab man in your area who's been doing it 10, 20, 30 years and go down there because the lab man is afraid of you because he knows doctors have big egos. They're all cowboy hat with no cattle. And he can't call you and tell you your impression sucks because he doesn't want to lose your account. So you have to drive over there and say, I am humble. I am hungry. I want to be better. And, and I know I from you. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. So, so get, we're, we're, same thing with specialists. Don't be sending people to some periodontist who doesn't let you in their office or some endodontist who won't let you. If you're sending molars to an endodontist and he won't let you come in there and pull up a chair and be your assistant, uh, find another one, but you you keep talking about making relationships, growing your networks. Yeah, and that's at at every turn. Um, some of the best dentists I know have those relationships with their lab techs, where not only are they welcome anytime in the lab, but on a big case or an important case or a difficult case, I see these lab guys show up in the practice the day that they're seating a crown or the day they're doing whatever the procedure is. Um, the lab guy's sitting right there at the chair side so that they understand exactly what's going on and they work that case together from start to finish. And, and you've got to have that, even with the, you know, the great materials that you have available to you now. And, um, you know, the, maybe it's easier to do certain things. That relationship with a really good, solid lab tech is, is critical to the outcomes of your cases. So, yeah, I couldn't agree more, Howard. And and what um, and if she if she's coming out and she wants to grow her network, um, why should she join? Uh, why should she subscribe to the Progressive Dentist Magazine and join your network? How could she grow her network by joining your network? Well, that's and that's that's actually a great way to put it. Um, the magazine is just the beginning of of what the Progressive Dentist is. It's an it's an introduction basically to a lot of industry experts and business experts that they may not have exposure to otherwise. And our goal with that and the whole reason that we charge a subscription is that we don't do any paid advertising in our publications. So you can't pay us to say anything. You can't, um, I guess that's, that's it. You can't pay us to say well, anything. Well, you, well, well tell, them, tell them the truth because some of my baby naive, but how many of these magazines they get at their office is the editorial paid for? A high percentage of it is. It's it's. There's a lot of things out there that have great content. They've got great clinical um, information and resources in them. But ultimately, you read the editorial, and woven into the message is something that someone's paid them to say. Um, that's again why one percent of the speakers are getting uh, funded by um, corporate. I mean, I mean, uh, dental manufacturers. Uh, a high percentage. And yeah, you, look at the, you look at these speakers. You look, look at so many of these speakers, and they don't know the story behind the story, but these people say, okay, we're going to rent this big space at your meeting, so we're going to buy this big old booth space, right. and these four guys are going to speak. Yeah. Right? I mean, does that happen, or does that not happen? Happens all the time. Is that the norm or the rare? It's the norm. Yeah, so, so um, and, and I'll, yeah. So. And not, not <laughs> In fact, that's, the, that's the best question you should ask when you're at a seminar. You should just raise your hand and say, okay, you've mentioned this company's product 19 times. Exactly how do they pay you? I mean, are they paying your honorarium? You know, I mean, get, get, yeah. get cynical. Get cynical. So, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. And, I'll, and so I'll, um, I'll just put this out there right now. No one pays to be in our publication, and we don't pay them to be there. They're there because they're vetted resources that we have seen these companies or products or consultants or authors or business experts, we've seen them produce great results for dentists. So are they perfect? No. But when they're not perfect, they do their damnedest to make it right. So, um, you know, that's, that's the reason we, we charge a subscription is because we're not supported by 
companies or or our authors or or contributors. It's about giving young dentists and established dentists alike a place to go to a place where it's completely um, genuine conversation about what's happening in dentistry and as a business owner, what you need to know to run a practice. So everything that's in there is simply compiled to be resources. And my goal through the Progressive Dentist or through the Pro Practice with Joanne Majors um, or through you know another initiative that I'm collaborating with Dr. Jill Wade, who's on our current cover right now, but she's got another um, closely titled platform called a Progressive Practice where we're all about bringing resources to dentists that you can trust. And um, we're not paid to say anything. We're just simply putting it out there because there's no one size fits all. If somebody says, Bonnie, who's the best consultant for my practice? I got to know the backstory because there's a lot of great consultants and coaches out there, but there's not a one of them that's right for everybody who asked me that question. So what's, what's Joanne's name? Uh, Joanne Majors. So with the pro, with the pro practice, Joanne Majors is um, she's spoken in dentistry for 20 plus years, um, particularly on implant dentistry. And I mean, I, I just I love her dearly. She is, is it a, one word J O A N N E. No, it's J O capital A N. So Joanne Majors, and I'll so send you the J O, and then capital A N. Yep, Majors. Just one in or two. For dentist. Um, and she works in the practice as well. So she's got a day-to-day -day reference. Oh, point. okay. So, and, you know, so, so she was a dental speaker and implant special, uh, specialist before she married a dentist. Now she's married to a dentist and works with a team. So she's got great perspective. Um, I, I love working with her and I love the results that she gets. She's not a consultant, but she speaks on a, you know, one day or two day event. And we've compiled all of these different podcasts and, and pieces of information in the pro practice to give people exposure to the people who can help them most. And again, the whole point is to help you build your network. Last, uh, last question. I can't believe we've already gone, uh, we've already <laughs> gone uh, an hour. Um, I know. A, lo a lot of these kids, um, you know, when I got out of school, I graduated May 11 and I got, I opened up my office September 21st. And the only reason it took that long is because the, uh, I, um, the contractor, I mean, I think he only worked three days a week on it. I mean, uh, my God, if you ever meet a contractor, you, you need to meet as many as you can because when you die, you'll never see one again. They're all in hell, um, you know. Um, but a lot of them are um, can't decide if they should buy uh, or start one from scratch to Nova. What would you say to that kid who says, should I buy an old man out or should I just start one from scratch? What would you say to that kid? I would say it depends on how solid your plan is. If you know exactly what you want in a practice and feel like you have the, the resources and people to guide you to get it right, then by all means, start your own. Um, people talk about, you know, you can't, you can't open a solo practice anymore and the solo practice is dying and I don't believe that for a second. I think it's all about how you manage the opportunity and, you know, if Aspen Dental opened up across the street, use that to your advantage. It's a different experience. So if you know how you want to be different, how you want to be unique in your community um, and, and want to go into practice, then I think you certainly can. But again, if you're going to go it solo, your network's never been more important. So develop it. Um, call me. I'm happy to help point you in the direction of some different people who, uh, who can help you develop the, the skills and the, the network that you need. There's okay, well, how, how do they call you? Um, uh well, well, what do you, what, how do they get a hold of you? Is it email, phone call, website? Uh, what, uh, what's the best way? They can do whatever's easy for them. So they can go to theprodentist.com, and there's a contact page where they can e email us. They'll get it to me if it's something that they specifically say, hey, Bonnie, I need some help. They'll get it to me. Um, you can email me at bonnie at theprodentist.com, and um, our number's on the site as well. So, I mean, we're here to help establish dentists. What's your number? Uh, direct number is 806-392-3300. And yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just going to repeat 806-392-3300, theprodentist.com. That's easy to remember. So Bonnie, spelled the normal way, B-O-N-N-I-E. Um, I've never seen Bonnie with a Y, have you? I have, but she was from Columbia, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bonnie at theprodentist.com. 
And uh, I, uh, I can't believe uh, that the hour uh, went by that fast. Um, but I just want to tell you that, um, you know, we both have been in publishing. Uh, I've been a, a huge admirer of your work. I think you're uh, amazing. And again, I've never met one dentist in my life that only read one magazine or went to one website. I mean, even even people think Facebook's all that. You know, when you're with, when you see anybody on Facebook, they got 25 apps on their phone and they right. bounce from Facebook to Snapchat to Instagram to texting to email exactly. to phone. I mean, um, there you know, there's if there's 27 apps on the phone, um, and, and I'm really excited that um, LinkedIn, uh, Microsoft bought Skype. Right. And then they just bought LinkedIn. And so I'm hoping, I'm thinking that before long, when I follow you on LinkedIn, if I want to talk to you, I'll probably just be able to hit a Skype button and you I can FaceTime so. just like an iPhone. I mean, don't you think that's where they're going with that? Oh, I definitely. I think, I think we're trying to make it easier and easier to connect uh, with each other and and I agree, Howard. I mean, I, like I said before, I, I couldn't do what I do today had you not gone first and done what, what you've done. And I uh, might, I, 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 I will, I will say, kind. no, I'm no, I'm not being kind. I'm just saying that, you know, you've, you've been inclusive and, and supportive along the way. And I, I certainly appreciate that and love what you do as well. And that's, that's the great thing about it. Neither of us is trying to be all things to all people. There are so many people that I'll say, man, go to Dentaltown. Um, you'll find what you're looking for and there. Your, I, I and your buddy and partner, uh, we podcast, Joanne Majors. Yeah. Um, that was podcast 532, Develop Connections and Create Value with Joanne Majors. That's awesome. Uh, on, That's um, a- yeah. And uh, I just, uh, like I say, I've been a huge fan of yours. I'm very uh, proud of what you work. And uh, and I just want to tell the kids one thing. When she says you can join and follow all that for $167 a month, uh, you I won't hear. do it. Uh, but you'll pay $300 for airfare to fly across the country to drop $3,000 on a course and learn something that you could learn all on YouTube for free. And my only beef with millennials is, uh, God dang, they spend money. Just they just spend money like like they're printing it in their basement. But yet they'll say on on educational type things they'll say oh, I can find it free on YouTube. And you're right. We even talked about that at the beginning of this hour that you can find all kinds of things on YouTube, but you don't know the slant behind it, and you don't know whether they're really experts or whether they're just good at producing a YouTube video. So. You know, the benefit of, of being a part of the progressive dentist community or the dental town community is you know what you're getting. Um, and I'll with- tell you and I'll tell you the difference between Facebook and dental town. So these dentists will post a YouTube video on their Facebook deal showing them do a, a gum graft or a gum surgery or whatever. Mm-hmm. And everybody says, oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, you're so great. Oh, you're so perfect. Because if you say anything contrary, they unfriend you. Then other people will take that guy's video, and on Dentaltown, uh, if you open up a thread, there's a YouTube button. So you hit the YouTube button, drop in the embed code, and uh, there's a video. And then you watch oral surgeons and periodontists just rip this stuff to shreds. And then they email me and say, oh, somebody's not being nice. And on, on the thread, if you it has a report abuse button. So if you think someone's... Uh, being abusive, then you can click that. So then we got a bunch of moderators look at it for free. And and you know you know what all the reports of abuse are on? They didn't <laughs> like what someone said. They live get in a it. bubble. Get over it. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, parting piece of advice: get over yourself. <laughs> well, the, well <laughs> and get face, over the Facebook. The Facebook is for people that want to live in a bubble. And every time they say something, everybody says, "Oh my God, you're Albert Einstein and Sir Isaac Newton all wrapped up into one." And then on Dental Town, they're like. Dude, where's your throat pack? You can't use a high-speed deal. You're going to get an air emphysema. And they'll just rip it to shreds, but they're just being honest. Well, and they're trying to help you. Ask for help. They're showing you what they see in areas that you need help. So if you don't really want the help and just want a pat on the back, just be up front and say that's what you want. If you really want help, be open to the criticism or the advice or the the conversation. Um, and, yeah, that's, I guess... On top of everything else, you got to develop a, a little thicker skin to be in this industry or any other right now when, when you've got so much access to, to video and instant communication. So, yeah. Well, get over- I, uh, I get the same <laughs> advice every time I ask my mom for help. She says, don't worry, Howie, I'll say a rosary for you tonight before I go to bed. 
That's no, no matter what problem I say. If I say, Mom, I just got sentenced to 30 years in jail. She say, don't worry, Howie. I'll say a rosary for you before I go to bed. But hey, Bonnie, thanks for I'll spending. Turn down a prayer, but thanks. <laughs> What's that? I said, I'll never turn down a prayer, but I'll take any other help I can get to. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for all that you've done for dentistry, for helping so many dentists for as long as you have. And thank you so much for coming on my show today and talking to my homies. Thanks, Howard. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for all you do. And I'll look forward to seeing you somewhere soon. Okay, Bonnie. Have a good day.